new stuff is, isn't it? Um, yeah, so my name's Liz Rice. I work for a company called Aqua Security. My background's engineering, um, but now I basically have the best job in the world. I get to kind of travel around. I write bits of code. I work on some of our open source projects, and I get to travel around and speak about things that I think are interesting. So I hope you'll think this is interesting as well. Uh, basically, going to talk about how we can manage secrets when we're using containers. Uh, I'm going to assume everybody here is using containers. Would that be fair enough? Anybody want to admit they're not? No? Okay. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, what do I mean by... I say, oh, God, there is somebody who... <laughs> um, I'm not going to start by saying what a container is, but I will start by um, just stepping back and thinking, what do I mean by a secret? So... A secret is information that you don't want other people to have. But specifically, I'm talking about things like passwords, credentials, tokens, the little keys that allow you to get into your databases or access particular kind of private interfaces. Um, so I'm not specifically talking about uh, maybe personal information that you might hold in a database. That's secret information, but what I'm talking about today is the secrets that you would use to access that database, okay? So they're typically small pieces of information. And when we're talking about containers, the important thing is to try and get the right secret into the right container at the right time so it can do its job and that it has access to the resources that it needs to have access to, um, but without sharing those secrets to other people who we don't want to have access to that secret information. And if we think about a cluster in a, an orchestrated environment, we don't necessarily know where containers are going to be running. So secrets management is about how we get our secrets from somewhere where we're storing them and into the right container at the right time so it can do its job. There are a few things that we would like to see uh, when we're managing secrets. And the first of them is that we want our secrets to be encrypted. We want them to be encrypted when they're at rest, so when they're in storage, and we want them to be encrypted while they're moving around your network. And ideally, you'd only ever have them decrypted in memory, never written to disk. Um, I guess just to sort of explain a little bit about why that would be the case, if you do have somebody infiltrate your cluster in some way, if the data, if the secret data is lying around somewhere unencrypted, we've just made their lives easier. They can, you know, they've, they've had the challenge of getting into the cluster, but once they're there, if the information is in the clear, well, you know, it's no challenge. The next thing we'd like to see from secrets management is some form of access control, some way of limiting who and what can access those different secrets. So both the containerized code, well, the containerized code and users in your system. Particularly if you're um, talking about, you know, a large enterprise, you can have thousands of people who one way or another touch your cluster, but only very, very small number of those people need access to, uh, let's say, the um, administrative passwords or um, particular um, private, you know, access to private parts of uh, a database. And the same is true for the code as well. Now, arguably, your code is, you know, it's inanimate and it's, it's ethically sound and, and your code is never going to do anything bad with, with, uh, with data that it might get hold of. But again, we're talking about what if one of your containers gets compromised, if an attacker gets into your system somehow, if that container has access to all of your secrets, then your attacker has access to all of your secrets. So we want to minimise the impact of an attack by restricting the secrets that any given individual container has. Ideally, you only have access to the, the secrets, the passwords, the tokens that your code needs. 
And then finally, write-only access. Now, the first time I gave this presentation, somebody went, Liz, I don't think you mean write-only access. And no, I do mean write-only access. Um, as a human being, I might be setting up uh, credentials, tokens for code to use. And I never need to be able to see that again. I might need to change it, but I don't need to be able to read that uh, secret back out again as a human being. And um, limiting human access to being right only is probably a good thing. And then the third kind of attribute that we want to see from secrets management relates to the life cycle of those secrets. So if you have a part, I mean, we've all heard this idea that uh, you should change your passwords regularly. Now, for sort of human psychological reasons, that may or may not be a good idea. But it's definitely true that if we're talking about secrets that your code has access to, the risk that somebody has somehow compromised your system just increases over time. So if you have a secret that's remained unchanged for years, uh, you know, maybe somebody has already compromised it, maybe somebody already has that secret. And by changing our secrets, invalidating the old ones and replacing them with new ones, if anybody has compromised a secret in the past, well, it's, it's rendered ineffective because we've just invalidated it. So for that reason, we, uh, we want to be able to what's called rotate secrets, just change them on a regular basis. And that is definitely something that I would recommend you to do if you have secrets that you don't want to get leaked. And sometimes they get leaked through, um, you know, bad actors. You know, perhaps there's a, an employee at your company who, um, you know, for what, whatever reason, behaves badly and leaks those secrets. What's more likely, and what happens a lot, is, you know, people just write down passwords on a post-it note or in a notebook, and then they leave the notebook on the train, and, and then they don't, didn't confess to it because they felt silly. And... Who knows going to pick up, who's going to pick up that notebook? But if we're rotating the secrets regularly, at least at some point, all those passwords or, or whatever it is they've written in their notebook are no longer um, going to be valid. I've also put under lifecycle the idea of audit logging. If you have, um, again, for a sort of enterprises, they may have compliance reasons why they have to be able to log what's happened to secrets, so when passwords have been changed, who's had access to them. And it, and it can also be very useful if you have to do a forensic analysis of an attack to have a record of what code and what set of people had access to what things at what time. So for a lot of uh, large deployments, audit logging is really a must-have when it comes to secrets. Okay, let's get into a bit more kind of technical detail now. So how can we get a secret? Let's assume we have a container, we have a secret. How can we get that secret physically into the containerized code? And there are some bad ways. You could hard code, <laughs> you could hard code those secrets into your source code. Um, really bad idea, particularly if you're writing open source software. Um, <laughs> You laugh, but, you know, how many people have heard about, you know, Amazon credentials being left on GitHub? It happens. People do this stuff. Um, don't do that. Um, your Docker files, the source for your Docker file is obviously a, a piece of source code as well. Um, but be aware if you put, even if you don't um, release the Docker file, if you put secrets unencrypted into images, Anybody who can get at the image can get at the secret within the image, same as they can get at your source code. Um, I guess the last thing I'm going to say about this is even if you have your source code, you know, maybe you're a, uh, a bank and all your source code is very carefully managed, um, the set of people who need to see your source code is almost certainly not the same as the set of people who need the keys to your bank vault. Just decouple them. <laughs> Um, if we think about rotation as well, you don't want to have um, the life cycle of a secret. Like, if you want to change a secret, you don't want to have to put, make a new 
change to your code. You want to decouple the life cycle of secrets and your source code. So if we're not going to hard code it, we have two options for getting uh, a secret into a container. One of them is to pass in the secret as an environment variable. So let's have a quick look at that. Should I make that a little bit bigger? Actually, this is my wrong window. Um, let's just do that. Okay. So I could do something like docker run, and I'll pass in a secret. Hello, Berlin. And I'm just going to pass it into an Ubuntu image. And if I look at my environment, I'm going to be able to see that. Okay, so that's fine. So when I launch that container, as so long as I have some way of passing in the secret, the secret is accessible within the container. Now, just to, uh, no, let's do Docker inspect first. You need to be aware that anybody who has access to Docker inspect or its equivalent uh, is going to be able to see your secrets. Here we are back here somewhere. Here's our environment variables, and there is our secret. Now, again, not everybody who should have access to administering containers should have access to you know, medical records. Uh, that's the danger of using environment variables, or one danger of using environment variables. Another thing to be aware of, this is much less of a real risk, but I think it's just kind of technically interesting. If we, I'm just going to make that sleep for a bit so that I can find the, uh, oh, pivot off sleep. I can find the process ID of a process running inside my container. Um, so this is the same machine, I should have said. And if I look inside the slash prop directory, I can find all sorts of interesting information about that process, including its environment. And up here, there's our secret. Now, that's pretty um, clear that environment variables are accessible from the host. If somebody's got root access to your host, you've got a lot of problems anyway. So um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. But it is something to be aware of. Um, so I talked about Docker Inspect. And in a very similar way, um, or, or perhaps the main reason why people will advise against using environment variables for secrets is logging. It's extremely common for if a process core dumps that it will you know, something somewhere will log out its environment. Um, in the case of an error, it might just log out its environment. I used to um, write things in Django, and that would, certainly in debug mode, be constantly showing you your whole environment. The set of people who look at your audit logs or look at your software logs and your error logs doesn't need to see all your passwords and keys and credentials. For that reason, in particular, uh, a lot of security people will just basically say, forget everything you heard about 12 fact apps. Environment variables are not an appropriate way to pass secret information around. Um, also, another thing that's kind of obvious is that if you can exec into a running container, you've got access to that container, and you can see its secrets. That's kind of always going to be true, though. If you can exec into a container, you're inside the container. That's kind of inevitable. So for a good couple of reasons, certainly those first two, maybe environment variables aren't that great. The alternative way to get information into a container is to mount a volume and pass the information in as a file. So um, if I do something very similar, I think I might have this in... Yeah, so this is basically exactly the same, but I'm going to mount uh, a secrets volume. And now my code, instead of reading the secret out of an environment variable, would need to look in a file. And uh, I have previously prepared a, a file. 
uh, with that private information in it. So uh, if I now edit that file, let's bring that up the screen a bit. Oops. Secret, secret, I think it is. And um, oops. Okay. It's the same file, right? That should be pretty clear. And the good thing about this, apart from the fact that I clearly can't spell the word private very well, um, the good thing about this is we can change that secret value, rotating the secret, without having to restart the container. The container can instantly pick up that changed value. Whereas with an environment variable, that is a lot harder, although we will come back to that later. Okay, so with a mounted volume, uh, Docker inspect, you can see the fact that the volume is mounted, but you don't get to see the insides of the files. So you haven't automatically exposed the secrets to anybody who is running Docker inspect. And we don't have the logging problem. You don't typically log your entire file system. So that, that's, that's pretty, let's fix those issues. Again, just to be aware, if somebody can exec into a container or if they've got access to your slash proc directory, they're still going to be able to get hold of that secret information. But again, that's, you know, you are in a lot of trouble if those situations are happening. Okay, um, before I, I've, I've written Kubernetes support for secrets. Is there anybody using a, an orchestrator that is not Kubernetes? It's okay if you are, you're allowed to. <laughs> but nobody chooses to, okay, that's fine. Are they still using Swarm? Who, who, was, who, was using, who was using Swarm six months ago or a year ago? And how about Nomad? No, anybody, anybody using? Okay. Right. So I think yeah. that normal has a uh, possibly easier alternative. Yeah. And what are you using for them now? Um, typically we're still trying to install Kubernetes. <laughs> 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 but we, we might end up using normal. If, right. If, if we fail. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, th there are other orchestrators than Kubernetes. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of time Nomad. for Nomad. But, I mean, uh, Nomad does look, yeah. really, does look really simple to set up. Yeah. But I think we can safely say that the majority interest here is going to be around Kubernetes. <laughs> okay, so kind of obviously if we go back to our bad places to put secrets, YAML files are another bad place to put plain text, unencrypted secret information. Um, you could obviously share the same issues as any other kind of source code. Uh, would. But we have these magical things called Kubernetes secrets. The, the Kubernetes supports objects that are called secrets. And you can refer to them in, for example, the secret in the pod YAML. You can define an environment variable where the value of that environment variable is going to be populated by that secret. And you can also uh, populate a file with a secret and then mount that volume into the pod. So basically we have support for both the environment variables mechanism and the file mechanism. Right, let's talk a little bit about encrypting these secrets. Kubernetes stores all its information in etcd um, unless you've done something something weird, which is possible, but almost everybody is going to be storing their information in etcd. And by default, etcd is not encrypted. You could go into your etcd database and you'll find all your secrets are base64 encoded, but that's not the most secure <laughs> way of hiding your secret values. Um, so if you're using 
at CD to store your secrets. If you're using Kubernetes secret objects, you need to make sure that encryption is turned on if you have anything of value that you're trying to protect with, with those secrets. And it's currently turned on with this experimental encryption provider config setting on the API server. And if you have that turned on, you also have to define uh, the encryption config that you're going to use. And so for something like this, uh, a, a file like this that you pass into your API server and you say, yeah, I want to encrypt secrets and this is the mechanism that I'm going to use for it and here is the key that I'm going to use. So you're going to have to be very careful no, I mean, it's, it's, it, this is not a, a, a problem with Kubernetes. It is a fundamental thing that happens whenever you're talking about encryption. You know, somebody has to have a key somewhere, and if you encrypt that key, you've got to have a key to unlock. You know, it's always going to be keys all the way down. Um, you just need to be very careful about file access to that encryption config file. Um, I think the documents say only the uh, sort of entity, the user that can run the API server should have any kind of access to that encryption config file. But yeah, that is you know, left up to you as a responsibility. An alternative thing you can do is, rather than storing the secrets in etcd, is store them somewhere else and use something else to pull those secrets and inject them into containers. Um, Aqua, my wonderful employers, are one such provider that enable this kind of integration with third-party stores. Kubernetes are also working on it. I think there's like a proposal. There might even be one plugin that's been implemented, I think. Um, but the idea here is that you have these amazing tools like HashiCorp Vault or the Amazon or Azure key services, CyberArk. There's all sorts of people who specialize in encrypting and looking after information. So rather than sort of rebuild it yourself or have Kubernetes rebuild it itself, take advantage of those third party tools. And then there's kind of gluing them together, either via a tool like Aqua or through the plugins that are currently coming along. Okay, let's move on to access control. We have RBAC in Kubernetes these days. This, uh, I started doing this presentation or a presentation a bit like this maybe nine months ago, and uh, this has all changed uh, you know, dramatically uh, in that time, um, where RBAC is now sort of the default thing, um, and you can set up roles for accessing any kinds of object. Um, secrets are a really good example of something where you want to limit access to, as we discussed, to the users and to the containers that need access. So for example, you could configure a role, something like this, to say, yeah, it can do read actions on secrets, and then you can bind that role to a user or a service account um, so that this user can now read secrets. And in this particular example, um, it's also limiting not just to secrets across the whole deployment, but limiting it to secrets in the development namespace. So that's one way of um, limiting access to uh, perhaps users within a particular team so they can only uh, see the secrets related to their their own project. If you can, it's really good practice to set up, uh, rather than sort of broad access to a whole set of secrets, um, individually name those secrets, because then you can have much finer granularity over who has access to which secrets and when. Uh, and, and you can do that with the, with the cluster role. I think this is kind of the last thing I was going to say about um, kind of theory of secrets management. Now, microservices seems to go hand in hand with what we're doing in containers. Obviously, you could have a huge monolith that we're talking about, but 
if you do have a microservice-based architecture, or even if you've got a monolith and you're just thinking about carving out little pieces of it, it can be a very nice idea to take the anything that actually needs access to secrets and put it into its own service. Partly because if you've got a very simple service that does kind of operations with, let's say, encryption or decryption, and it's the only thing that gets access to the key, it'll be easier to see, it'll be easier to limit access to the, so that only that microservice can access the secret. Um, it'll be easier to uh, log any changes or, or use of those secrets. You know, if anything other than that little microservice tries to use that secret, that's a bad thing. And um, if you, uh, if you're able to split it out, you sort of benefit from losing some of the complexity. If you've got a service doing a whole lot of things or a container doing a whole lot of things, identifying when it got compromised and did something bad with a key is going to be more difficult to identify. It's more difficult to see when something has been compromised. Um, so it, having this idea of least privileges, saying a given service should ideally be limited to doing a small number of things, and we will try to limit its privileges so that it can only do that small number of things. Um, is a, it's a good practice in security, and for secrets in particular, you can do that by splitting out microservices that are dedicated to, to using the, the secrets and that that's all they do. Another thing that's a very good idea is to use read-only mounts for these secrets, because um, there is no reason for, or there is almost certainly no reason for a container, under, unless there's some very unusual purpose. It only needs to read the secrets. It, it doesn't, maybe you've got a service that does writing these things, but it, it would be unusual to need anything other than read-only uh, access to these keys. Right, life cycle and rotation. So we kind of talked already about how you can change the file, and because it's the, the, because the file is sort of mounted, it's the same file from the host perspective and from the container's perspective, we can change a secret value that way without needing to restart the pod. Um, but in general, it's hard to update the environment variables without restarting the pod. Um, not quite sure why I put this in this order, actually, but uh, this was to do with... Oh, I know why, yeah, because I was talking about life cycle, and uh, I also put in life cycle that idea of logging. Kubernetes supports uh, defining what kind of events you're going to have audit logging on. One of the things you can log is secrets. You know, it's a resource, so we're going to log these secrets. Um, you get this metadata level, which is a good thing to use for secrets because you don't want to be logging all your secret values. So metadata logging will allow you to just log the, um, the fact that secrets have been added or changed or whatever. Okay, so secret updates demo. This was a little bit fragile earlier, so let's see whether or not my minikube is still up and running. Okay. Oh no, it's not. Yeah, this is going to be annoying. <sighs> okay, let's... How long have I got? Shall I try and make this work? Okay. I'm just going to have to... Oh, this is... Yeah, this is going to be painful. Um, You, you might see some some slightly uh, internals of, of aqua, but it's pretty cool when it when it happens. Oh. Yeah. This may not work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah, that's disappointing. I've upgraded my minikube last week, and I'm regretting it. Is is the bottom line? Um, okay. I am going to skip over that for now. It's unfortunate because I was going to show you a very cool thing. Um, why can't I do that? 
I know what I could do. Let's try. I have to talk for a little while while this happens. Uh, this takes so long to start a VM. This is why containers are so great, right? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to have to do some mucking about as well. Uh, have I got... Uh, okay, uh, no, that's not what I want either. That's what I was looking for, I think. No, it isn't. Oh, I've shut the window. I'm going to have to give up on that. It's, <laughs> you'll, yeah. I'll try and restart it after I've done this and after we've done, and, and if anybody's still here when I've got it working, you can, uh, not, not. okay. Um, essentially, what I was going to show you there is how um, the Aquatool does a little bit of magic and it basically, you know how I said you can't update environment variables without restarting the container? We have a way of enabling you to do that, which is pretty nice. And um, I was also going to show how um, with Kubernetes you can change a value of a secret and uh, within, I think it's the, the kubelet sync time, it will update the, the file so that if you're using the mounted file version within, and uh, it's typically a minute, within, within a minute you can update the secret using just regular Kubernetes. And I was also going to talk a little bit about how Aqua lets you kind of uh, link with these services like Vault and whatever. Okay, so um, in summary, and I quite like the idea that, you know, if you are doing anything with secrets, you can go away and think, I have some things I want to change here. The first thing is just go and double check whether or not you've got your etcd encrypted or not, because if you haven't, you might want to turn that on. Um, I, when I first did this talk and I showed that slide that talks about bad places to put your secrets and, and like, not putting in source code and not putting in your Docker files. And I kind of thought nobody really would be doing that, particularly if they work for like a bank or something. And I was amazed. There was this kind of, it was quite a big conference and there was a room full of people kind of going, taking notes. And somebody came up afterwards and said, I, I'm going to be making some changes to the way we manage our secrets. So yeah, if you have got secrets in your source code, don't do that. Um, and then the third thing I'm going to say is, Think about your secret rotation um, because if you can have a regular secret rotation just happening regularly all the time and it's just part of your daily process, then when something bad happens and you realise that somebody did leave like the keys to the kingdom on a tr in a notebook on the train, you don't have to go through any special practice. You, it's, it's something that you do every month or, or what have you, rotating your secrets. So... Um, Get, if you have secrets, if you have data that needs protecting, getting into the habit of rotating your secrets is a really good thing. Okay, uh, we have a little bit of uh, collateral there. There's a, a kind of secrets management guide that uh, should you want more details, in particular anybody who is secretly using Nomad or Docker Swarm or uh, Marathon and Mesos, all the details are inside that uh, that download. And with that, um, I guess I take some questions. Questions that aren't what would your demo have done and how bad. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's a good idea to have, like, a fire drill for these things. Um, so one thing that people sometimes do is they have two sort of sets of credentials so they can sort of change one and use the other one while that one's changing. And 
and sort of step them like that um, if it's essential that they that they have kind of continuous access. Um, I mean, I guess in this world of containers and, and services, the, the other thing you can do is kind of f force the issue by just killing... You know, you need to be able to tolerate the idea that you're going to kill a pod and wait for it to restart anyway, so... Um, that might be another option. Any more questions? Yes? Okay, so the, uh, th this is the the credentials that you're using to access the private registry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So actually, something I didn't mention is that Kubernetes has this um, image pool secrets. Um, it's like another flavor of secrets, so you can configure your um, yeah, that specifically get used just for pulling images, and you can say in your sort of container spec, use this secret for pulling images. So it's like a dedicated registry credentials object. Is that stored in etcd as well? Or how uh, yeah, okay. yeah, it is, yeah. And with concomitant potential for being in the clear. Actually, that reminds me of another interesting thing, which is um, for those of us who use things like Macs, we're used to the idea that our um, Docker login credentials are all kind of managed by keychains. but. Now, I haven't done a lot of experimentation. I, I, I just had a conversation with somebody about this, and I thought, I should double-check this. I believe that if you are on something like Linux, by default, your Docker credentials will just be sitting in the clear in a file somewhere. So um, that might be, yeah, there's a lot of nodding going on. So that's another thing just to be aware of. <laughs> okay, I think there's another, yes. Yeah. 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 So some of that is kind of secret source. It's a proprietary solution. But essentially, we have a uh, I'm supposed to use the word enforcer. It's really an agent. We're all technical here. Like, there's an agent running on each node, and it uh, inter it uses the the socket, the Docker socket, to um, be aware of containers that are starting and stopping and sort of gets itself some pretty intimate knowledge of the Linux processes associated with that, um, such that it can inject environment variables directly into the process. Yeah. So still you say uh, use environment variables, just uh, rotate them regularly, um, so there is nothing else than uh, environs or I.O. Okay, so I think... I, I, Um, so I think the question there is, is there any alternative to yeah. environment variables or, or files? Um, no. You know, you get, like how do you get, how else do you get information into the container, containerized process? Um, somebody once said to me, but surely you could kind of pass it some kind of encrypted set of things. But you've still got that problem of secrets all the way down. How does the container decrypt the key? You've got to get the key to the key. It's... Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, files and environment variables are really the only way of getting information in. And the image itself, obviously. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. that <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Uh, so... The watch endpoint. Now, I've, I've read two conflicting things here, so I'm going to be slightly unsure about this. Why would we allow, um, uh, we allow it yet, yet we pass to the, to the secrets? But it's not a good idea to uh, not allow watch um, the request. Yeah. So why? Yeah, watch and list. So um, there's list, which is, which is more obvious that. Um, if you allow somebody to list secrets, they get to list kind of all the secrets. So that's not 
as good as limiting their access to individual named secrets. Um, and watch. Now, I've read two conflicting things about this. I, I read somewhere that um, you can't watch individual resources, but I was looking at the API actually early this afternoon, and I think you can do watch on an individual named secret, in which case that would be fine. But if you do a watch on all secrets, you that, that would be something to be careful of. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would. I think for the benefit of the recording, the the question was whether or not if you rotate your secrets often enough, you're effectively using a one-time pad. And I, yes, that. I, well, I guess so. That's the extreme of that. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea as well that um, uh, if you have an exploit or if you're if you have a compromise of some sort, there will be some amount of time between the bad guy getting into your system and the bad guy being able to do something effective like exfiltrate data. So you have that amount of time in which to kind of change things. Um, and this whole cloud native thing really helps us with that because you can just be regularly pulling, you, you don't necessarily even need to know that a compromise has happened. You could just be, because cattle not pets, you know, we can just be ripping things down all the time. You know, and if we happen to pull something out, pull the rug out from underneath the feet of an attacker, oh, too bad. Yeah. What's your experience with uh, rotating secrets uh, in regard to external APIs? Do providers um, give you a way of using your own and your new credentials in a grace period? So you have a mm, that's a, rollover, that's or is it just hard cut and yeah. restart? That's a great question. I really don't know. I really don't know what the, you know, the world of third-party I mean, APIs would. X509 certificates, you could always have a period where the old and new are still valid, and you have yeah. a smooth rollover there. But with that's true. Secrets, uh, there's no well, this time. this can apply to certificates as well. So certificates are another form of secret, um, or the the secret part. Of the Question. Okay, so the question was, how often do you want to rotate your secrets? And the answer, like everything, is it depends. <laughs> um, uh, like, partly it depends on the value of what you're protecting. You know, if you're, you know, talking about your personal, I don't know, WordPress blog about trees or something, you know, no, no disrespect to trees, um, you know, but if it's something that it doesn't matter, then really it doesn't matter, you know, if you've got um, bank account details to worry about, then um, something more frequent might be appropriate. Um, I think it's pretty common to be rotating things like somewhere between every week and every month, and I saw a demo once, uh, a Docker security demo, and I think they were talking about rotating things every hour, but just for demo purposes. So I guess that's a pretty extreme, extreme case. And it sort of depends a bit on how um, disruptive it is to actually go through that secret rotation process. Yeah, if, if, if you don't have the ability to sort of run things in parallel, how bad is that for, for what you're doing? It always depends. That's always the answer. Okay. Did everybody get an Aqua sticker? There's some Aqua stickers on the table, so make sure you get one. <laughs> okay. Is that? I think that was all the questions. Yeah. Good. <laughs>